I'm really sorry that I can't talk to everybody individually. I really like to. It's so hard. I, I can't explain to you. Like, I used to be to a place where I'd come, like, and I could just hang, you know, and, and I like hanging, but I, I never can get anywhere when I just hang, and it's really hard. Um, so I, I don't want you to ever think that any of you are invaluable and that I don't want to talk. Please don't think that. That's not me. Some people have even seen the videos and they come to a conference and there's like 5,000 people and they're like, he didn't talk to me. And I'm like, oh man, dude. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be mean. I just, I'm, I'm, I want to make it so that we can all talk to Jesus. I mean, I, I, I can't explain to you like how important it is for me to get that simple thing across to everyone so that we can all have personal relationship, not confess that we have one, but really have one. It's different. Communion with God is, is different, honestly. And it's, I, I talk about it everywhere I go, but really that's the key to all this, being on your knees with your Bible open and saying, God, I don't get it. And never allowing how you grew up and how you couldn't read when you grew up and how it was hard for you to read when you grew up to, to stop you from getting in the Word. The devil would love to have you use that as a crutch to remain bound forever. And he'd love you to go to meeting after meeting after meeting. You know, I, I don't believe the devil is really concerned about us going to church. I really, I honestly don't, I don't believe that he is. I think he likes it when it's in, when it's in the form of religion. He likes it because he can pin us against each other. He can get you to read the Bible for what you want to look at it for instead of what it truly says. He can get you to try to validate a movement or a stream that God never actually asked us to have streams. We have rivers that He never asked us to have. We have camps that He never built. If you read in your Bible, it will tell you that we're supposed to be all of the same mind. Same faith, same Father, same Lord and Father who over us all and in us all. Same baptism. Same everything. And so sometimes we've just got it so, we go down these so many different streams and so many different roads, we just don't know which one is ours. And then we find out all these tools, like I said, and sometimes the tool belt is so weighing us down that we don't know which one to use, but we got a lot. And honestly, the thing that we need the most is relationship with Him. And relationship with Him isn't a one-time confession. It's a life lived on your knees with the Father. To where you can pour out your heart. To where your heart and His heart, they exchange. And you have koinonia. You have communion. You have, you have fellowship with the Lord. Fellowship with the Lord. Reading your Bible and fellowship with the Lord isn't just reading your Bible, getting through a chapter and saying, I did my Christian duty. That's just tragedy. You okay? Some of you are kind of like not even paying attention. When I talk about reading the Word, like it's crazy. I, so many people come to different things and, and I talk about the same stuff. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what else to talk about. But I'm meeting people all over the earth that are getting in there for the first time and it's opening up their hearts and opening up their minds in such a way. And it's not open-mindedness. It's one-track-minded gospel. One track minded is different. See, I'm gospel track minded. I'm, I'm a single focus. It says that the eye is single, your whole body's full of light. It says that the eye is the lamp of the body. It says, you know, it's talking about treasure. It's talking about finances. It's talking about stuff. It's talking about laying, for you, laying up for yourself stuff here or stuff there. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, thieves can't break in and steal. And it says, don't lay up on the earth treasure. And it can mean a lot of things. And I understand it's talking about finances and it's talking about that stuff. But it's not just finances. It's talking about where you put your heart at. So I'm not putting my heart in a place where I can't wait to get to heaven so I can gather the treasure. And the Bible says that I'm supposed to set my mind on things above and not beneath. How am I supposed to set my mind on things above if I can't ever get in the Word to tell me what's there? And how can I represent another world and a kingdom that Jesus paid a price for me to represent? It's at hand. It's within your reach. 
But if you live by what you can see and what you're feeling, we can't afford to live sensual. We can't afford to, we can't afford to live feeling oriented. We can't, I have people come up to me and ask me to pray for them so they might feel God. I tell them, absolutely not. That's horrible. Why would you ask me that? Well, because I've never felt God. Good for you. You're not supposed to. It doesn't say feel God. See, there's a lot of talk about presence, and I am all for it, okay? I'm not against the presence of God. It's everything. But sometimes we equate presence with feeling. And you see somebody in church that's shaking, crying, laughing, jumping around, whatever, and you're sitting there wondering when that's going to happen to you. And you've forgotten that the reality of the love of God has been revealed to us and that the Holy Spirit's been poured out into our hearts. He cries out, Abba, Father. The love of God is this. When I was a sinner, He died for me. When I was. So now He paid a price for me to, extra, for me to exit sinnerism and enter into saintism. Not Satanism. Please hear me right. Someone heard me wrong. What? <laughs> to enter the place of being a saint. Yeah. Ephesians says that the fivefold ministry is for the equipping of the sinners for the work of ministry. It's not what it says, but when you say that, a lot of people get freaked out. We're coming to an understanding that that's what it says, but what does it mean to be a saint? It means to be a holy one. Whoa, dude. What is a holy one? Jesus. What is it like to walk like Jesus? To be holy. People are like, well, it's impossible. Holiness is legalism. Jesus wasn't a legalist. He was love. The love of God is holy. It's beautiful. It's something that you didn't deserve. I love it. Why do you give? We just haven't become like our father. I love it. Way to go, John Hammer. That was amazing. You know why? Because God's a giver. If you can't give, people, people will think God's a thief. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures here where moth and rust destroy. You know that money's not the problem? It's the love of it. Because you can either love God or love money. You can't love both, man. Yet God's not like needing your money. He's pretty secure. <laughs> but money has a way of having you. It does. When you don't have it, you can't give it. And if you can't give what you don't have, you'll never give when you do have. And I'm not saying that for your offering. <laughs> I'm saying that so that you're not taken by, by money. You know what really, 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 really overwhelms people? I was coming through an airport. I forget where I was going. Oh, I was going to Houston. My baggage was way delayed. And that's what happens sometimes when you travel a whole lot. My baggage, like, sometimes doesn't even come. But I'm there. <laughs> so I have to quick one to, one to Walmart and get me some t-shirts and some whatever I can do. If it's hot, I get away with shorts and ask if I can during the day and wear pants during the night. And I, I, I'm just, man, I'm, I'm at an airport. I'm actually in Raleigh. That was the first time. The next time was in Houston. The time before that. I just have, it's been bag loss time. They come eventually. You know, but there's a line of people that are pretty angry. Very angry. Really angry. <laughs> and when my bags aren't there, boy, people are like so mad. Not because of my bags, because of theirs. So I sit in the customer service line, in the waiting line. It's, an, it's not a happy place. It's even worse than people's flights being canceled. It is. I love to speak up in those lines too. It's amazing. I do, because I don't have anything to talk about except Jesus, dude. I'm one track minded. I just really don't have anything to talk about except Jesus. People are like, what do you do for fun? That's fun. Yeah, but what do you do to relax? The gospel. Yeah, I know, but like, you know, you have any hobbies? Mm hmm. The problem is, is if you have to have all these things, you know what? There's a lot of times where people go on retreats to try to find rest. You ain't going to find a retreat rest. Sorry. Your retreats aren't rest. Your vacations aren't rest either. No way to find it there. Your rest is in the finished work of Christ. Your rest is in the blood of Jesus. Your retreat will not give you rest. 
Your retreat is an amazing time, but it would be a shame if you shut off Jesus and then pick him back up when you come home. It would be a shame if you went on vacation and forgot him. He didn't forget you. It would be a bummer if you pumped gas without him. But let's go back to vacations and retreats because that's a problem. Burnout is a problem. What is burnout? Burnout is a life that's been lived in its own strength. You should burn out when you come to Jesus and like burn up when you get Him. It's the love of God that sustains. It's the love of God that keeps us. And so people are striving to receive His love and you're trying to earn something that can only be given by grace. And grace is the, the undeserved favor. We said it earlier. It, it really is. You didn't deserve it. You get saved. It's amazing. Now it's not about beating you up trying to fix you. Grace enables truth to function in your life. But if you never get into truth, grace can't function. And then you might call it grace when the miracles hit your life and you bypass all this character thing and be like, that's legalism, dude. I don't need character. I got miracles. You'll stand before God and really be bummed out when you go to hell. Ah, <sighs> that's good. <laughs> you know, because hell wasn't created for us. It's not for us. People preach that there's like, I just, I, I'm hearing that people are thinking there's like no rapture and none of that stuff. I don't, like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? God can't be that bad. He wouldn't send people to hell. God doesn't want anybody to hell. It's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Him. That's His will. It's His will. And He wants to use us to accomplish that. But sometimes we're so afraid that it's really hard for us to step out or we're so entrenched in, in debt, we're so entrenched in not being able to pay our bills that we're waiting for our ducks to get in a row until we can. Since when did it, was it about your ducks being in a row? Dude, if that has to happen, you're in trouble because Satan's the, duck manipu the manipulator of ducks. He will completely mess with you, he will completely entrench you with stuff, you will be your own worst enemy. So I'm in, the, I'm in the customer service line and I'm like, and, and at first, like 20 people's bags didn't get there. So there is a problem, you know, 20, 21. And I'm like, whoa, okay, there's, there's got to be just a delayed baggage thing. So I just went in the lady, I said, hey, I said, our bags are delayed, right? She goes, I think so, they should be coming out. And there was a guy in front of me, he's like, all right, I'm going to go out and check and just wait. So I just stood by the door and I'm like, you know, I, my ride's here and... I'm going to just ask her to check. So I gave her my ticket. And she looks, she goes, you know what? Your bags are still in so-and-so. I go, I, I knew it. She goes, all of them are. I went, oh, okay, cool. So this guy comes back in. Now all 20 people are behind me, and this guy that was first is now last. But he ain't happy because he doesn't know the Bible. <laughs> now watch. <laughs> So he storms up to the front and he's like, way to go. And he's screaming at this lady. I mean, freaking out. You told me in my bags and this and that. And he is screaming. And I'm like first in line and I'm in front of him and he's really mad. And I'm like, what do you do in that case? Well, he made the wrong decision. See, he yelled at the other guy too. The other, and this guy was not a guy that worked the counter, but he came in mercy. He came in there in mercy to help this poor girl out. He's standing behind the counter and this guy goes, he goes to him, he goes, yeah, what's the problem? And this guy looks at the airline guy, he goes, shut your mouth. And I was like, because that's not normal. But he, he's a baggage handler. Like he's one of the guys in the back. He's not supposed to do this job, but he knows how to do it. Shut your mouth and give me your ticket. What did you just say? I said, shut your mouth. To this guy and I'm like, wow. The world's hostile, dude. That used to be me. Way worse. Me was way worse. So this guy goes, I can't believe you just said that. Just shh, be quiet. The guy's like, mm. He's just boiling, man. So I'm talking to this lady. 
And I said, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You guys work hard. Man, I know you got about 20 people. You know, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you so much. She goes, thank you, sir. And this guy's even more mad. I said, you know, my luggage gets lost a whole lot. But it's okay because you guys always find it. It's so cool. She goes, she goes, what do you do? I said, I preach the gospel. I said, Jesus is so good. He loves you so much. She's like, thank you so much. And the guy that told that guy to shut up, I said, man, God loves you, bro. You're amazing. He goes, thank you, sir. <laughs> Gives me a big, this is awesome. I looked at the guy that was so mad. I go, grace. Grace enables me to live this way, man. God loves you, man. Don't you forget it. Don't let life squeeze you. He looks at me and he goes, thank you. He was so mad. I'm in these situations all the time. You live in the same world I do. See, we get afraid of those situations and we walk away. But that's where Jesus would be. And that's who God has called us to be. He's called us to be infiltrators. He's called us to be salt and light. He's called us to be a preservative. So I am a preservative. Salt is a preservative. It preserves stuff. So when I go there, like, I'm salt. Dude, I am like salt. That's who you are. God calls you salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how does salt lose its flavor? It's to be thrown out. It's useful for nothing. That's not you. You're not useful for nothing. The devil is useful for nothing. But if you keep listening to him, he will dull down your flavor. He will take your flavor and make you flavorless. We can't afford to be that way. We have to look in this word, find the things that will help us. I'm going to read some. Is it cool? We good? All right. I found this in my Bible. If you don't have one, you should. Because if you don't have one, you can never become one. You need to become what the Word says, man. How can you become something that you never get into? And how can something get into you if you never give it time? See, we say, well, I, you know, I've been a Christian for 10 years and I still, it's really hard for me to understand. I get it. I, I get it. The word is like seed, it goes in, it, but if your heart is open, it bears fruit, it has to. When the seed is sown, it grows up. So what you do is you get in the word, and you don't understand it when you're reading it, but all of a sudden you start to produce amazing fruit. The problem is, is we think we have to feel that seed hitting home. It's not about your feelings. It's about you diligently studying the word to show yourself approved. Check this out. This is like amazing. It's so good. Oh my goodness, this is good too. Wow, and this, this here before it is amazing. Oh my gosh. How many people ever get anxious? We were like, is this a trick question? No, how many people live with anxiousness? How many people live with worry? People are like, I should start saying, how many people live with no worry? See, this is, this is where it's at. And it's not, I'm not talking about a pipe dream. I'm not talking about fantasy land. I'm not talking about some dream. Oh, if I could only, only live without it. I've lived without it for 10 years. Going on 11. I've lived without it, but I've pursued one thing. I've pursued sitting at the feet of Jesus, man. I pursue getting in this word and saying, God, this is who you say I am. My life needs to line up with this. God, I don't, it doesn't seem like I'm getting everything. I'm asking you to put it in me. So what I do is I get an audio Bible. I have an audio and a visual. So I watch it and listen to it at the same time. So it hones my eyes and hones my ears. So my eye gate and my ear gate are totally taken up. It's hard for your mind to drift when both are focused. It's really awesome. It's just a tool. I have the visual Bible. I watch it. The gospel. The gospel of John. The book of Matthew. The book of Acts. They're, they're all visual Bibles that are out there. Amazing. Bruce Marciano plays an amazing Jesus. He's just a happy Jesus. 
I believe Jesus was happy, but he cried a lot too. Like in his heart, he cried out. It says that Jesus, like he had vehement cries. And I understand that in the secret place, when he was with his father, that's where he did it. He cried out for you because you, you were the joy set before him. You were the joy set before him so that you could become the joy of God. What do you mean the joy of God? Well, how can you be anxious and joyful at the same time? You can, you'll just believe there's mountaintop Christianity and valleys and mountains and valleys and mountains and you will live a roller coaster that's not in the Bible. And you will live a life that's in the wilderness and you'll pray for somebody to get you out of there. There are two wilderness you can be in. There's only one legal one. The wilderness that the Israelites were in, they were out there for 40 years and they went out there selfish and it was woe as them. Do you understand that they were selfish and they loathed the worthless bread? The worthless bread, the worthless bread fed every day and it wasn't good enough for them. They needed it some other way. They needed something else. They wanted some meat. They wanted some leeks, some onions, something else. It wasn't good enough for them. They wanted it seasoned. They wanted it fried. They wanted something else. Man, this bread. And things in the Old Testament and things in the, in the wilderness, they're in the kingdom of Pharaoh's kingdom. They're, they're making bricks in Pharaoh's kingdom. They're in the muck and the mire and it's a type and shadow of sin and how it encases us and how we're entrenched in it. Building bricks for another's kingdom. The whole Bible is, is the same thing. It's all a picture of Jesus. And you've got these, these Israelites that are out there. They cross the... Man, imagine if the sea split. That had to be crazy amazing. Really crazy. Getting to the other side. And imagine that it crushes everybody that was chasing you. That had to be crazy. And then like we're like, we need some guidance. Okay, here's a pillar of fire. That's a lot. What about the daytime? Here's a pillar of smoke. What are we going to eat? Here's some bread. Yeah, but what are we going to drink? Here's some water. It says that that bread was, was sustaining. It sustained them in the wilderness. But all they did was complain. But God in his mercy still sustained them. Do you know complaint and criticism and gossip is what kept them there? Do you know they loathed the worthless bread? Do you know that that bread was Christ? says your father is, you, you know, you guys, they ate manna in the, in the desert. But Moses didn't give you that bread. My father gave you that bread. And I'm the living bread. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. What? They loathed it. What did they do? You know, godly contentment is great gain. Great gain. Godly contentment. Paul talks about being clothed and being naked and being hungered and fasting, beaten, whooped, all this stuff. And he says, godly contentment is great gain. Being content with God. Being content, not with the stuff that you have. Not the things that you're getting. Not laying up for yourselves treasures here. But being content with who God has created you to be. But because we don't understand our identity, we're searching and wondering when is going to be our big break. And Satan is pinning the body of Christ and getting her to focus on what she doesn't have. And she's wandering around in the wilderness, selfish. And she doesn't see the bread that came down from heaven. Don't say that Jesus isn't enough for you. Don't say that Christ isn't enough. Christ is enough. He is the bread. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Wow. Unless you become one with him. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood. Yes, it's communion, but it's more than that. It's more than that. It's partaking. Listen, when you say you're one with God, you've now become flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. You've become living bread for everyone around you. Man, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. Jesus Christ is the rock. He is the foundation. He told Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you know that? The revelation of Christ is the building of the church. That's the foundation. That's the rock. Jesus says, he who hears these sayings of mine 
and does them. I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. That's what he says. I will liken him to a wise man. And when the storms come, the storms come to both. But when the storms come and hits the man that's built it on the rock, that's founded on the rock, what is the rock? Is it just your Christian confession? No, it's hearing and doing what Jesus tells you. Yeah, but how can I do it? No, you've become it. So the byproduct is doing. Jesus is the rock that followed them around in the wilderness. He's the one. It says Christ was that rock. So Christ was the rock falling around. And water flowed out of this rock. And how many people were out there? And they drank from that rock every day. For 40 years, still complaint, criticism, gossip, complaining, murmuring. Anxiety, anxiousness is simply a lack of identity and understanding who your father is. You can't trust him. And I'm not saying trust him for the things that you've prayed for and not God. Because sometimes we ask and we ask amiss because we ask for our own lust and desires from within. We have not because we ask not. That's been preached as a prosperity message. Knock it off. You're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God will add to you. But we've not sought that. We've sought things. And when things don't show up, we get upset at the one that should have gave us that stuff. I talk to people every day of my life, man. I hear what is in people's heads. I listen to, well, you know, when I was, you know, 12, my parents were praying and, and God never showed up. Yeah, I tried that Christianity thing. What are you talking about? This isn't try it. This is give your life completely to it. How dare you let your picture of lack determine who your father is? I'm not mad. I hate the devil. He hates me. That's legal. God gives me a pulpit not so I can entertain you. I am not an entertainer. I'm not. This isn't play us a song. Piano man, play us a song tonight. You came to the wrong show. I'm just not an entertainer, man. I'm not. I love my father way too much to entertain you. I want my father to drive a sword deep into the heart of his church and clean house. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need to understand that, see, we are a temple. We're a temple of the temple of the living God. We are God's temple. We are God's house. We're God's house. Jesus came into the temple and they were, they were selling things and they were doing everything opposite than what they were supposed to be doing. They used the temple for the wrong things. And Jesus went about flipping out. I teach my kids that mean people need Jesus, right? We're watching that. We're watching the, the Gospel of John. Jesus comes into the temple and he's like flipping tables. My little daughter, she's like three at the time. She looks at me, she goes, Daddy, Jesus needs Jesus. The zeal, can someone come play piano for me? Because it'll be easier. It'll help it go down easier. It really will. It'll just help. Sorry. Are you okay? Can you do it? Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you so much for coming up. So, my daughter says, Jesus, Jesus needs Jesus. I said, honey, that's amazing. Jesus has Jesus. That was good. She's coming to my prayer room and I'm crying out. She says, Daddy, you need Jesus. She sees me crying out in my, my cry time. I try to be quiet. Because I want the door shut. My kids know they can come in if the door's shut. It's not like they can't bother me. If they're not a bother. I try to wake up. I try to wake up and get in there before my kids get up so that I'm not, so that I don't have it but my Little one, Daddy, you need Jesus. Daddy has Jesus. Honey, Daddy's hurting right now. Honey, Daddy, what's wrong? We pray for you. Okay, pray for me. 
So she prays for me. I said, let's pray for God's bride. Daddy's hurting because she doesn't understand who she is, honey. My kids know I go to preach Jesus. My little three-year-old talked to me back there. Daddy, I love you. I said, I love you too. My other kid, she says, my little eight-year-old, she goes, Daddy, I don't like when you have to go. I said, honey, people are going to hell. I can't live with that. She goes, no, you're right, Daddy. We love you. We pray for you. I mean, thank you. I need it. Jesus is in the temple and he's flipping tables, man. Because God's house is to be called a house of prayer. But they made it everything else. And honestly, I feel that I'm called to come to places so that Jesus can come into your heart and flip the tables, man. Really? And that you just like wake up in the morning like, what happened? The tables got flipped, dude. None of them are standing. There is no money changers any longer allowed in your heart. It's like finished. He takes out all that junk. This has been a favorite scripture, favorite scripture verses of mine. I have a couple of them I want to talk about. You guys okay? I really, really, really appreciate you. Thank you for coming. And thank you for not getting upset because I can't talk to everybody individually. I really like to. You can send me an email. Just, I don't know how to handle it. I, I, you have no idea. And I talk about testimonies of talking to people all the time. And I do because I'm around people all the time. I mean, on an airplane going to Slovakia. And I'm on the plane and I'm like, God, I love you so much. Someone walks by, Todd White. I'm like, hey, oh my God, dude, you changed my life, man. I'm like, that's amazing. No, it was another, it was Argentina, sorry. I said, man, that's awesome. What do you do? He goes, man, I fix cars. We got a mechanic shop in Argentina. We fix like, like we fix up, we build big Jeeps and all that stuff. He goes, we got a big TV screen inside like a seven foot TV screen. And all we do is play your videos all day long in the car shop he said guys are underneath underneath the cars like cranking wrenches yeah it's crazy he's like we're doing it man people come in get their stuff worked on we're praying for them they're getting healed saved delivered that's awesome all I'm doing is representing normal I'm not I'm, I'm special because I'm God's kid but I'm no more special than any of you. All I am is a son that knows it. I know I'm a son. My sonship isn't for sale. It's settled. The issues are settled. There is no controversy over it. There's no debate. You can't talk me out of it. I wasn't talked into it. I wasn't talked into it. He came and flipped my tables, man. He flipped everything. And I never tried to set him up again. He came and gave me this blank canvas. He came and gave me this pure heart and I've never violated it with anything. People are like, dude, how do you handle like, how do you handle the whole like, people like being drawn to you? No, no, no. It says when the Son of Man be lifted up. I will draw all men unto me. All my life is a picture of the product of what the Son of Man lifted up did. And he has put me into a place of just being a son. So all I am is bringing up the reality of the body of Christ's identity to normal. I'm not like above average. I'm normal. I'm not like some freakishly anointed person. I'm a son and I believe the Bible. And I'm filled with the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The only thing special about me is that I understand that. I believe it with my whole heart. I've surrendered fully and completely. There isn't anything in my life competing for my value. There isn't anything in my life competing. There is no competition to see who's going to be first. I celebrate you and think it's amazing that you're stepping out. I'm not fearful that you might pass me. Bring it. Do it. Run. Just make sure that when you run, you're grounded in truth. And you live with sound doctrine. And you're not validated by the miraculous. You make sure, I'm not, it sounds like sometimes when I talk that I'm like against people doing miracles. Dude, they happen every day in my life. 
I'm not against him. I just know that it's the most dangerous place for you to be in. Because if you gain who you are through what you do, you're in deep trouble. Because your gift will make room for you. But if your character's not there, when you get there, you're dead. Why? Because you can't live with yourself. And all of a sudden, you're cheating on your wife, you're cheating on your spouse, you're embezzling, you're, you're doing something, you're just out there. You're using drugs in order to sustain yourself. But man, your stuff just comes around. God's not slack, guys. He sees everything. He wants us to live and to build on the firm foundation of righteousness. He wants us to build on the foundation that I talked about in 2 Timothy 2, the, fir the firm foundation of God. It stands. The Lord knows who those who are His. And let anybody, and then everybody that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That's not legalism. That's the freedom that's in Christ. But the firm foundation is the rock. Jesus is the rock. That's the firm foundation. He who hears these sayings of mine and does them. How about this? He who hears my commandments and does them, that's the one that loves me. Don't tell me that you love God, but you don't want to do His commandments. He who does not love me doesn't do them. That's pretty point blank. That's why people want to cut the words of Jesus out of the Bible. That's why people take the Beatitudes out. Whew, that's impossible. That must be Old Testament. The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Why would you want that to be Old Testament? And even if it was, it says that nothing's going to be taken away. Not one I, not one T, not one letter. Everything is still intact. But when you get born again, Christ comes and makes His home inside of you, which enables you to obey. Because obedience is the love sacrifice. It's the sacrifice, it's the sacrifice, the living sacrifice that we've all come to become. The Bible tells us to pursue certain things. It tells us to have these things. It says not to go outside of these things. It says to pursue peace and holiness. That's a pursuit. Pursue peace and holiness. It says earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. I get it. We can't afford to come out of legalism and just pursue the gifts. You know that everything... See, we think that if we maybe go off track and not focus on the gifts, since we don't have it, that it's not going to function. Are you the one that makes it function? What could you have to lose by, by, by going after Him? We can't afford to just know God's works. We have to be in a place of relationship to where we can know His ways. And in these last days, in past days God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days God has spoken to us by His Son. Jesus is heaven's final answer. Are you guys with me still? Okay. It's laced with word because it's beautiful. It is. He's beautiful. Philippians. Four. Be anxious for nothing. Oh. Gosh, we should just go back and no, I'm okay. Chapter four, or, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. This is crazy because if you look at the, the, the place that Paul wrote the Philippians, wrote this book from, it was a dingy, yucky dungeon. Yuck. Horrible. Musty, yuck. Probably a rat or two. Pretty horrible place. He, reads, he writes... Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice! With an exclamation point. Sorry. <laughs> let your gentleness be known to all men. He's in prison. He didn't say, let your stress be known. He didn't say, let, let everybody know how bad we're being treated. He said, let your gentleness be known. <sighs> Do you know how horrible it is for a person when they treat you bad to get treated with kindness? Oh, it's like heaping hot coals. Love your enemy. <laughs> pray for those that use you. Bless those that persecute you. And pray for them that persecute you. We're so hurt. We're so offended. We're so 
wronged by people that it's so hard for us to get into a place of prayer because we're so used to praying for ourselves. God, what about this and this and this? And God, I wish you could change my job, maybe change my boss. I need a little bit more money, maybe a raise. God, I'm praying for a raise right now. Father, I thank you. I hope today's not as bad as yesterday. Man, your today will be a wreck. It's not about praying for your day to be better than yesterday. And so God, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you so much that today I might look like you more. God, I ask you to take the word that I've put in my heart and breathe upon it. God, today give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Father, I thank you that when I get squeezed, you come out. When people push me, they get Jesus. I'm an air freshener. When people push on me, pfft. It says this, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. It's so hard for people to pray with thanksgiving when they're lacking. So hard. We're lacking and we're praying with thanksgiving. We're thanking God, I have nothing. Thank you. That's not it. It's thank you, God, that even in the midst of this place and even in the midst of, of this trial that I'm in, God, I know that you're faithful and I thank you so much for being God. Father, I thank you that you're never insecure and it's never about how your day's going. God, I thank you that you have made me a man that it's never about how my day is going. God, you are my day. Father, I thank you that you've created me to have today. God, today is a day of salvation. Now is the time for salvation. Father, I thank you that right now my spirit, man, is being quickened because the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of me and will quicken my mortal body. So my flesh has to sit down and shut up. Thank you, Father. It's just a different way of praying. That's my thankfulness. I live in a place of thank. I can get thank you, Father. I'm really good at saying thank you. Thank you, God. Oh my gosh, you're amazing. Someone is really, really angry to me. Really angry. I mean, I get it all the time. You know what I mean? Not everybody's comfortable with this message. I get people to rebuke me. I get people to send me emails that are not nice. You can send them. It's okay. It's not going to change my theology because my theology is Jesus. Because Jesus is perfect theology. He's exactly who the Father was. He's generous. He's beautiful. He's lovely. He was persecuted. Says if they hated him, they'll hate me. It's okay to be hated. Don't let people's hate against you produce hate within you. Don't let people's judgment towards you produce you to be a judge. There will be a day of judgment, but we're not right now to be in that place. I take everything captive to truth, and I live by the standard of Christ in me, the hope of glory. I live by the love of God. The love of God's consumed me. Let your request be made known to God. Sometimes we interpret that as ask God for everything. Now, there's a place, and I'm not... God doesn't mind you having things, but He minds those things having you. So it's very important before you pursue things. See, because if you pursue Him before you pursue things, you'll never pursue things. Because all things are in Him. And He is the one that satisfies. He is the fountain inside of us bringing forward. You know that rock was Christ, and the water came from there. Do so you know that everywhere you go, you're like living bread, dude. Everywhere you go, you're supposed to have rivers of living water flowing out of you. Why? Because the revelation of Christ is here. And He constantly flows. I don't need prayer to get filled up. I stay in a place of communion. I'm not saying don't pray for me. This fountain never shuts down. I don't leak. I gush. But that's you. That's you. That's who God says you are. I live in a place of communion. I don't have to go and get my tank filled up. I live in a place of relationship. I live in a place of being on my knees. I live in a place of being one with Him. He loves me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. He's always with me. I don't feel Him. I know Him. I don't feel that He's with me. I know that He's with me. I very rarely feel the Holy Spirit go, oh. The love of Christ compels me. His love for you, because I understand His love for me, and I have this love for Him. So I love Him 
He loves me. He loved me first before I love Him. First John. Before I love Him, He loved me. I told you that story about the birth canal. If you didn't hear it, you should get it. It was really good. <laughs> There's a lot of chances of me, but I was the one that made it in the egg. God thought about me way before my dad did. Way before my mom did. The soul of a woman and the soul of a man should never determine your value. And how could my mother that didn't really know God and my dad that didn't know God, how could them and the things that they said about me when I was little determine my value now that he has come? We teach people to cater to their feelings and to live their feelings. Oh, you don't feel like, oh, well, let's deal with that. Be very careful. Teach people who they really are. Tell them who their daddy is. You find out who your daddy is and you taste and see that he is good. Everything changes. Oh, my. Shut up on me. I'm talking too much. Sorry. Oh, this is so good. I didn't, look. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God. Wow, there it is. Peace is the absence of anxiousness. Peace is the absence of worry. But it's not peace like the world gives. Jesus says, the peace that I have to give you isn't like the world gives. No, no, no. The peace that Jesus paid a price to give us couldn't have been given to us until Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. Because on Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and changed Peter. Changed those people. Changed 120 of them. Boom. And then it just went boom. But peace came. Peace comes from being right with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, Romans 5, I have peace with God. How are you justified? How? Because of righteousness. Because Jesus has made you right with the Father. The war is over of trying to get to God. The veil has been torn. The way into the Holy of Holies is through Jesus' flesh. That's the veil. So we enter into His presence beyond the veil. Beyond the veil. And we spend our life in that place. And that place is the peace that God wants to give the bride. It came to you the day of salvation, the day that you said yes to God. But because we don't enter into here and find out what God says, we take everybody else's word for it. We go on a thousand different things. Not that people aren't good preachers. That's not it. Only Jesus Christ can give you rest. Only the blood of Jesus can attain peace for you. It says, and the God of peace, and, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. In other words, all the brilliance in the world, all the brains, all the books, all the everything, all the knowledge in the world. It says the God, that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will do what? It will guard your heart. So it's going to protect your heart. And it's going to protect your mind. Through Jesus. So we keep talking about this 18 inch gap. The peace of God guards both of them. But righteousness is what enables you to live in that peace. And to stay in that peace. The blood of Jesus is what he said would give you rest. Come to me all of you who are weary and burdened down. And weighed down by the issues of life. The things that we're praying to stop. But these things aren't stopping because we've positioned our hearts and our minds here, wanting God to hear. But He says, I want here. And He wants to guard it with His peace, His love that surpasses all understanding. And it's only through the cross. It's only through the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's only through Christ and Him crucified. That's really it. It's really that simple. We need to narrow this thing down to the narrow way that leads to life. Many are called, but few find it. Don't be the many that are called. Be the few that find it. The many are called, they're all called to the same thing. They're called to be sons and daughters. For those he's called, he's justified. To those he's justified, he's glorified. We're waiting for something. We're asking God for something that's already happened. And we're wondering what the new thing is. And the new thing is the same thing.
It's the one thing. It's him. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is heaven's final answer. Come on, you got Peter, James, and John up on the mount of transfiguration. Jesus shines with the glory of heaven. His clothes are laundered like no other. It's like amazing. He's inside out shining. Moses was up on a similar mountain, but only his face shined. And he received the law from God. And because of the glory of God's holiness, his face shined. But it was a covenant that you were not going to be able to fulfill. So you needed another to come to fulfill it for you. So that you can stand in a place where your whole body could shine. Jesus is turned inside out. Peter, James, and John are there. Moses is there. Elijah is there. Peter's like, let us build three tabernacles and hang here. We've got the best of everything. We've got the law. We've got the prophets. And we got, I don't know, man. <laughs> and God shuts Peter down. A cloud comes down. And Moses and Elijah are gone. Jesus is there and he's not shined up anymore. He says, come on, don't be afraid. What happened? Right before Jesus says, come on, don't be afraid. God said, this is my son. Hear him. Stop looking to everything else. Him. Jesus is heaven's final answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. But when you meet Him to become like Him, you need the Word inside of you, flowing through you, possessing you. You need to know the truth about what God says you are. The Old Testament is type and shadow. I get it. It's all about Jesus. Don't study it until you know who Christ is. Because when you read the Old, there's still a veil there and still Christ is revealed. Christ needs to be revealed to you. It says we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Behold the glory of the Lord. It says the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face, Moses had a veil on his face, not just to keep the shine from people from seeing it, but from keeping the people seeing the shine that was fading away. Because it was fading away for a new covenant was coming to where we could shine. Jesus was transfigured up on that mountain. It was amazing. The same word is in Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be ye transformed. Why? By the renewing of your minds. How does that happen? It happens on your knees. It happens opening your word and studying it and saying, God, this is who you say I am. Grace, let grace come and empower this to be my life, God. Thank you, Father. And God says, oh, by the way, meditate on a couple of things. Check this out. 
so good. The God of peace, or the peace of God, because He is the God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, wow, finally, thank you, finally. Finally, what is this God of, what is this peace of God going to do that surpasses understanding? What's it going to do? Well, finally, this is where, this is like the cap, this is going to cap it. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, true, okay, truth. Jesus said truth a lot. Truly I tell you, truly I tell you, truly I tell you. Truth came through Jesus, only through Jesus. Truth. Jesus was the Word made flesh. So when you look into here, people say, you know what? Moses, you know, nobody can look at because God came before Moses. He said, show me, show me your glory. In Exodus, and God said, I, I will let all my goodness pass before you. The goodness of God passed before Moses. But he told him, no one can look into my face and live. When you're looking into the Word, and you open your heart to it, you are looking into the very face of God, and you can no longer live. No longer. You can no longer live for you. That's what it means to deny yourself. Pick up your cross. How can we be picking up a cross if we never enter into His Word to find out what it even means? Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue which means excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things. What things? True, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praiseworthy. Man, that's some amazing stuff to set your mind on. That's setting your mind on things above, man. That's due in Colossians 3. Therefore, set your mind on things above, not on things beneath. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures here. Lay up for yourselves treasures there. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Is your Part just on lack. heart in a place Man, I wish... I had more.
Is your heart on a place of wish that you had my life? If that's the truth, it's because you don't know your own. God only made one me, and He only made one you. If you see who you are, you'll stomp the devil every day. You'll stop listening to him. You'll get in this word, and you'll read that and be like, oh my gosh. God, I haven't been seeking the things that are true. I've allowed a lot of things to be true. But that's not true. Oh my gosh, this is totally opposite. God, help me. These things, he says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. Oh. Paul is saying, look, these are what I've put my mind on. Whatever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good report and virtue, if anything's praiseworthy, meditate on these things because these are the things that you received and heard and saw in me. These do. So he says, meditate on these and these do. So meditation on these, the byproduct is doing. That's awesome. Are you guys happy? I'm really happy about this. One more. Happy baby. Gosh, it's so awesome. Help me, Jesus. Bless that baby. More. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Way more. Okay, check this out. Second Peter 1. I just want to hit this. Man, this is amazing. I'm commissioning you. The Lord is. This is like way more powerful than you think. See, what's happening is if you, you came to this meeting, if you came to this meeting hungry, and your hearts were open for all that God would do. Because when I came in here, I really, I'm in the back, I'm talking to my daughter, but I, could, but I could sense an expectation in people. What if your expectancy can only be satisfied with the peace of God that surpasses your ability to understand it? says Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is 2 Peter 1. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained, that's you. If you said yes to Jesus, you obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus who knew no sin became sin so you might become righteousness. You might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness satisfies the peace, the lack of peace. Righteousness satisfies the anxiety problem. Come on man, Matthew 6 talks about don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. But, it's right after where the treasure is your heart will be. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures here, but lay up for your treasures there. Because the eye is, uh, the lamp of the body is the eye. And if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? We're talking about no one can serve two masters. Are you guys with me? And then he goes into, hey listen. Consider the birds of the air. They neither reap nor store away in barns. He's talking about don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. The birds, they don't reap nor store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father provides for them of how much more value. So he talks about value, our value, our value. Of how much more value are you than they? And he says, don't worry about what you might wear or what you might drink or what you might eat. Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He's talking about our value. And he says, don't worry. He says, after all these things. I said it here before. I know I do because I say it everywhere. He says, don't, you don't have to remind God about the things you need. He really knows already. He knows. You don't have to remind him. Like, he's not, like, absent. He knows. 
You don't have to remind God about the things you need. He's actually saying, and don't, you know what? After all these things, the Gentiles seek. After all these things, the pagans seek. He's like, worry is the act of art of paganism. That's what he says in the Bible. You can look, it's Matthew 6. It's pretty amazing. He says, but you, no, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added to you. Everything gets added to you when you seek out the right standing that you have with your father. Because there is no lack in him. You have everything according to life and godliness. The problem is that Christ isn't enough sometimes. We loathe the worthless bread. And it keeps us in a wilderness. Those Israelites were in a wilderness selfish. Jesus went into a similar wilderness, wilderness but he went in there selfless. And came out with the Holy Ghost in power. When you think that Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected isn't enough for you. And you need something else to satisfy or to give you peace. Don't you dare lift something up stronger than the reality of your relationship with Jesus. Don't you dare bring something into your heart and keep that before Christ. Don't you dare allow a sport to come in and allow that to be your Lord and Savior. Don't you allow a TV show to be your Jesus. Don't you allow your kids to be your Jesus. Don't you allow your spouse to be your Jesus. Don't you allow your job to be your Jesus. You set your mind on things above. And you meditate upon the things that God's told us to. And the God of peace, the peace of God, will guard your heart and your mind. Constantly, He will be your rear guard. The helmet of salvation is to secure your identity of a believer. We are arrayed in battle gear. We are warriors. We have the gospel of peace upon our feet. We have a belt of truth around our waist. The Bible says to gird up the loins of your mind. It says that we have a breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, I'm right with God. You cannot pierce this thing. No, none. I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a shield of faith to quench every fiery dart. And I've got a sword to slay hell. It's the word of God. It cuts you deep. It judges the thoughts and intents of your heart. It's a spotlight that shines deep inside of you. And reveals the things that need change. But then grace comes. Grace comes, and then truth comes, and grace empowers truth to happen. And all of a sudden, you look into the Word, and you realize you're staring into the very face of God. And you're on your knees, my God, mercy. And you go to bed with peace. You stop freaking about how tomorrow might be. Because you've sought right standing with God. You're right with your Father. And no matter what hell says, it doesn't matter. I love this because Peter is like, this is this guy that was transformed. I see the time. That was good. I wasn't even looking. I see, see you looking at your watch. It's a protection thing. I'm with you. I don't want to miss my plane. I'm with you. Are you guys getting anything out of this? Because everybody tells me, dude, I don't know how you're growing like you're growing. I really, I really, I want to do what you do. If you want to do what I do, then listen to what I have to say. I am giving you tools. That's all I do everywhere I go. It's the tools of Christ. It's the reality of the gospel. I put myself in here. And I never, ever look away. And I go after this thing with everything I am. It says, to those who obtain like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. What does it mean to have grace multiply? What does it mean? Look, we, we're like wondering where peace is. What if you could have the multiplication of it? Like, one bit of peace from God is good. Multiplied peace is ridiculous. Like, grace is amazing. But God wants to give us a violently excessive amount of grace, an abundance of grace. 
It says that we reign as kings in this life through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord as His divine power, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It is through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. By which, we ha- by which we have been given, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these, through what? Through the great and precious promises, through the glory and virtue, through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. Through His divine power. Do you know it's God who wills to do in and through you to accomplish His stuff? God, it's especially joyful for Him, for Him to will and to do in you according to His good pleasure. God wants to in you, will and to do in you, so that it can flow through you according to His good pleasure. It is a fountain springing up. It is waters that never, ever run dry. There is no dry and thirsty land in a believer. We are water. We are bread. We are salt. We are life. We are the way the truth and the life. We are the life of the Father personified. This is not me taking glory unto me. This is just giving God glory. He paid a price for me to look like Him, walk like Him, talk like Him, respond like Him. Not like attitude, like us. Respond like Him. That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature and have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Man, people said, well, you know what? We just got to back off of that because, hey, we're always going to have lust and stuff. You're wrong. God wants to kill it. He wants to crucify it. He wants it to be dead. He wants it to be dead. He wants that thing that used to call our name from inside of us when we get born again. He wants to root all that stuff out completely. Jesus comes through. Boom, flipping tables, man. So that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, when all that stuff is going crazy in your heart, you have this peace that surpasses everything. Check this out. But also, for this very reason, what's the reason? Because you've been partakers of the divine nature. That these precious promises are you. He called you by glory and virtue. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Godliness is amazing. That's living like Jesus. That's godliness. That's the character of God, not just the power of God to do miracles. That's the power of God to live blameless. That's the power of God to walk as salt and light and to live and walk in the midst of a perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the Lord. God's called us to, He's called us to shine. He's called us to have rivers flowing out of our belly. He's called us to look like Him, to respond like Him. Don't lower this Bible down to your theology. Bring it up because Jesus is perfect theology. He's called you to walk like Him. My Bible says, be imitators of God. That's godliness. Gosh, I'm not doing well here really want to say this stuff I want to read the word but it's so good it's just it provokes me but also for this very reason given all diligence which is speed and haste add to your faith which is absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt convinced The example is a house with no empty rooms or a town with no empty houses. Be fully convinced, absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt. Add to that virtue, which is the excellence, a spirit of excellence upon your life. And to virtue, knowledge. Knowledge isn't just head knowledge. No, no, no. He's just talking about it. It's the knowledge of Him. God wants to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. It surpasses everybody's understanding. It surpasses everything. It is the peace of God. The peace of God is available. 
It kills anxiety. It kills worry. It kills doubt. It's faith in your Father. It's the love of the Father. Add to your faith virtue, excellence. Add to that knowledge. Add to knowledge, self-control. That is an awesome, awesome fruit of the Spirit. Only from the Spirit. Self-control, temperance. And add to your self-control, perseverance. Wow! Perseverance, patience. Patience only comes through trial. Trials produce perseverance. Perseverance produces hope or character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint. That is where that is. Perseverance, patience. Trials produce patience. And let patience have its perfect work in you, James says. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Patience has its work in you. And you lack nothing. Who here would like to lack nothing? Then welcome the trials, but see who you are in the midst of them, so you can manifest the right God. To perseverance, godliness. Huh, there you go. Trials come, patience comes, you're manifesting God the whole way through that thing. All creation is waiting for you to manifest God when you're going through hell. Trust me. People are leaving. Pastors. My goodness. I'm done. <laughs> to godliness. Brotherly kindness. What does brotherly kindness mean? <laughs> you my protector. He's going to snatch me up. Just let me get to the end of this. To brotherly kindness, love. That word love is charity. That word charity comes from agape. That's the agape love of the Father. Saying all these things, they build one on another, on another. They all go together. It says that we're not supposed to lack any of these things. Brotherly kindness, love. If these things, listen to this. This is how sure the word is. Listen to how direct and amazing this is. If these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what it says. If anyone, if anybody lacks these things, he is short-sighted even to blindness. You are not blind. You do not have a veil on your face. You are not blind. You see. You need to see what God sees when you look in the mirror. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sin. Again, it talks about never looking back, never looking at what you came out of. Only looking forward to what Jesus Christ has paid a price for you. Regret produces death. You can't afford to look back. You have to see the cross. You have to see the finished work of Christ. Don't keep looking in a rear view mirror revisiting things that Jesus says are finished. Believe the cross. Believe the finished work of Christ. Believe it. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will, listen to this, if you do these things, you will never stumble. People are like, oh man, everybody's going to stumble. My Bible says that you never have to. I'm not preaching elitism. I'm not even pre preaching perfection. I'm preaching Christ and Him crucified. I love you. You can do this thing. Stand to your feet. I, uh, I need leaders. I need the people that, people from the church, I need you to come up here. I want everybody to remember this. Come on up here, guys. I need you all up here. My ministry is called Lifestyle Christianity. 
on the website is free teaching. I'm not telling you to come for any other reason. Come, all these teachings are free. All I teach is identity. I'm not trying to build a big ministry. What I want to do is just raise the bar to normal. That's it. I, that's all I want to do. Raise the bar to normal. You are the body of Christ. The fullness of Him that fills all in all. The grace of God is available. And the God of peace will guard your heart and your mind. Protect your heart and your mind. Come and get free teaching. As much as you want. I'm going to load it up. I'm going to put hundreds of teachings on there. There's already a hundred plus on there now. Hours and hours. There's probably 170 hours of teaching on there. Just saturate your soul, man. Go bonkers with identity. Go crazy with it. Meditate on the Word. Because everything that I teach will push you into the Word. Everything. And it, won't, and it won't push you away from church. It'll drive you into a local church. Well, I don't want that. Well, you're not part of the body then. The local church isn't your problem. You are. I promise. Don't be afraid. Put your hands on your hearts and your minds. I'm going to pray right now over you. And I'm going to commission what I preach today to hit your heart and your mind. I'm going to pray that this thing saturates you, that you wake up different tomorrow morning. Listen, I, I'm not playing a game. I really heard that in my heart. I heard that. That's why I said tonight's going to be a commissioning service. Here's what's going to happen. You are going to wake up completely different in the morning. You are going to look in the mirror and see something you've never seen before. I'm not claiming to be anything, but I know when I hear the word of the Lord. So everything that I preach today is going to hit your heart today when you're sleeping. And you're going to get rocked when you wake up in the morning. And you'll have peace tonight when you sleep. That'll be amazing. Me laying hands on you isn't going to fix this issue. Jesus Christ being deepened in your heart, your mind, your soul. Jesus is the anchor of your soul. The anchor of your soul. The anchor of your soul deeply lodged into your soul. So Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for the body of Christ. I thank you for your girl. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you. Father, I'm asking you to overwhelm people and give them the reality of this gospel. Father, I thank you that you will rock them, that you will shake them. I thank you that tonight when people sleep, that you said that you seal up the instructions of the day. God, I thank you that you would take this word. God, I'm asking you to commission, to commission, to commission right now. Right now, God. Right now, Father, commission your bride with peace. Commission your bride with peace. Commission your bride with peace. In the name of Jesus, I thank you. God, I ask you to touch your people. Father, let this word be the reality of their life. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. Thank you for normal. Thank you for normal Christianity. God, I ask you to touch your people right now in the name of Jesus, God. Right now. Right now, God. You do it. Holy Spirit. I thank you for sovereign encounters with Jesus Christ. Encounters with the Spirit of the living God right now for everyone in this place, God. God, I thank you that we no longer be a body that is moved by feelings, but we will be moved by grace and truth. We would worship you in spirit and in truth, God. We would worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for crazy favor upon this bride. Father, I thank you that this church, that everyone listening, everyone would run and not grow weary, would never burn out, that the reality of faith and virtue and knowledge and self-control and these amazing things, these pure and lovely and true and noble 
and things praiseworthy. God, I thank you that godliness, we would be marked by it. God, I ask you to rock this bride. Rock this bride in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Great grace, God. Everyone here. Father, I thank you that tonight, healing, crazy miracles will flow in this place. God, I thank you. Father, thank you that we would be imitators of God. Bless your people. Jesus, thank you. I want everybody here right now, turn around. I want you to bless somebody right now. Bless somebody. Come on. Just do it. Bless them. Pray for them right now. Got this? All right. I would like for the prayer team members of Sunrise Christian Center to come down to the front. All the prayer team members. We're going to line up across the front here. If you are a pastor or a ministry leader and you're here from 
uh, outside the region here. We want to pray for you. want to bless you. We have prayer team members up here to do that. You've been commissioned. Now it's time for us to do it. But for those of you that are in leadership especially, we want to bless you and pray over you and over your ministry. So if you're a ministry leader, you can come forward and our prayer team will minister to you.
Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. We came up with a website, it's called Lifestyle Christianity. We have our newsletter that's gonna go out. You can sign up for our email list. We also have testimonies on there, event schedule, all that stuff. It'll be amazing. We wanna empower a generation to walk Christianity as a lifestyle. So we can all walk with the power of God on a constant basis. It's gonna be awesome, so come on over. Bless you, thanks for watching.